Hi, my name is Narayan Mandalika and I'm a group product manager at Uber. Today we'll be discussing about the build versus buy analysis. <clears throat> a little bit of introduction about myself and some background about myself. Um, I'm a group product manager currently in the platform engineering team at Uber. Uh, the platform engineering team is a centralized team that provides uh, the tools and the products to be able to develop uh, software at Uber and be able to deploy that software and manage it in production. Um, we essentially provide um, the infrastructure and the platform to be able to run all our services on top of. Uh, prior to Uber, I was a product manager at VMware managing the Kubernetes management platform. And before that, I was at HP managing the cloud management platform. Uh, prior to being a product manager, I was an engineer working in the payment gateway, infrastructure management software, and the cloud automation software. So now let's talk about the build versus buy uh, analysis um, framework. Uh, it's essentially um, a decision-making framework for software companies uh, who have both the engineering prowess as well as the IT budget to be able to buy software. And it is these companies primarily who actually go through this kind of an analysis so that they are able to figure out how best can they use their engineering resources internally uh, to solve their business problems and whether a given business problem needs to be either built in-house or should it be actually something that uh, they need to look out and get a product and integrate that into their environment. And the outcome of such an exercise uh, really varies, you know, company to company. Uh, you know, there are several both internal and external factors that could influence uh, the outcome. Um, many things uh, such as, you know, the culture of the company, the maturity of the company, um, you know, the confidence uh, in the engineering talent would uh, actually play a big role in um, the end outcome of such an analysis. <clears throat> now let's talk about why this is important to organizations. One, it promotes a healthy debate before even trying to solve the problem. You have to consider various factors such as time to value, how critical this problem is to the organization, how it aligns with the goals of the overall organization uh, before you attempt to kind of uh, go about either building or buying software. And all these um, you know, decisions have to be made up front. Um, it's also a great opportunity for PMs and engineering uh, teams uh, to be able to look at various products and understand um, the, um, you know, the problems and the features that they're trying to solve. Um, and also, you know, during this process, uh, both the PMs and the engineering teams um, would probably uncover uh, some interesting use cases, especially because, you know, the vendors would be interacting with many other customers and they would be enriching the products uh, based on their conversations. And some of these use cases would probably be applicable uh, to the R itself, to your org as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's something to consider. The other is that it could also result in some good partnerships. Uh, since you get to talk to various vendors, leaders in the same problem space um, as you go through the evaluation process. And now you can also continue to build that working relationship and collaborate and partner with them as you implement some of these solutions uh, within your organization. Um, it could also lead to some interesting uh, options down the line. Uh, for example, if you're trying to solve a mission critical problem or a problem that is going to help you in differentiating significantly from your competition, you may your organization may be willing to invest in, in maybe acquiring um, maybe a niche player or a small um, vendor uh, so that you are able to kind of um, acquire for building the talent and maybe you may be able to quickly build this capability out or extend the, the, um, the vendor's product that you have acquired uh, so that you are able to kind of uh, uh, bring in that time to value. At the same time, you are able to cater to 
specific internal needs that your organization uh, might have. <clears throat> so now let's talk about <clears throat> um, the phases of analysis. Um, you can um, you know, think about this entire build versus buy analysis to be primarily of uh, five main phases, at least that's how uh, I perceive this to be. Uh, one is the build cost estimation, uh, which is uh, an internal um, estimation that you have to go through to be able to understand what does it take for your engineering team to be able to build this product out, operate on this product, and then also, you know, what does it take uh, for your team to be able to maintain this product and the infrastructure product, infrastructure, uh, the cost of running this product in-house. Um, <clears throat> during this process, um, you go through um, an elaborate process of identifying the requirements and uh, validating which ones are critical uh, you know, for your organizations, which ones could wait, et cetera. And we'll go through this, um, the, the factors that we use as part of the build cost estimation. The other is the vendor evaluation process. Um, you identify the vendors who are solving this problem and um, you evaluate these vendors. Again, we'll review the factors there. The product evaluation phase is identifying the products, uh, how best they meet uh, your requirements. And then finally, shortlisting those products to be able to go through a POC phase where you get much closer in terms of the details, right? I mean, you test the product, you um, you experience the product so that you're able to evaluate this product in your environment or integrating it into part of your environment. And then um, at the end, you use all the data that you've collected and frame an opinion and be able to do a build versus buy or even partner um, analysis. So, you know, at the end of the day, you actually have to make a decision whether you want to build, buy, or you want to partner with one of the vendors out there. I've, I've indicated in, in some of these phases where you know, you'd be um, better off by partnering closely with, uh, with engineering so that the outcomes are going to be a lot more meaningful for your organization. And you definitely need um, the engineering partnership, especially when it comes to estimations, uh, when it comes to actually integrations uh, during POC, et cetera. <clears throat> so now let's also consider some of the factors um, before you go into doing the analysis. Um, you know, the, the factors that you have to consider is the level of maturity of the problem area. Uh, you can probably use the Gartner curve, hype curve to be able to determine if this problem is something that many vendors have, have already addressed, uh, there are mature vendors uh, in the marketplace with mature products addressing this problem area, then why go reinvent the wheel, right? Um, so you probably want to kind of lean towards more of a buy decision, unless there are uh, factors, outliers that uh, um, you know that are very specific to your organization. The other is um, you have to look at the organization strategy and the goals. What is uh, you know how critical or mission critical is this problem uh, that needs to be solved, um, and then. Uh, the pulse from the leadership is another aspect. You need the support from the leadership um, before you go through this analysis because it is going to take a substantial amount of time, both from the product management and the engineering uh, team, as well as down the line, the leadership. Uh, and you know the net outcome from this exercise uh, need to be supported also by the leadership so that you're able to get to the implementation phase um, uh, after the analysis is complete. Um, the culture of the organization, again, uh, you know, look for whether there's a bias within the organization to be able to, to build or buy. Um, and then the other aspects to look at is what is your confidence uh, within, you know, whether you, within your organization, whether your engineering team can actually, um, you know, pull off this by building something or would you encounter hiring challenges let's say if you don't have enough engineering resources to build this capability out then you probably want to kind of lean towards more of a buy if you you notice some of those challenges um, also look for what is the current and future it budget based on your current and future projected scale uh, you know this is going to be very important both for the build as well as the buy uh, the current and future IT budgets will be required from an infrastructure point of view. If you were to build 
but you need to still host this product in your environment and maintain and manage that. So you have to think about you know the infrastructure cost of doing that. Uh, if you are to buy, then you are looking at you know the licensing cost um, and uh, potentially other costs such as network egress costs, etc. From your data center or from your uh, cloud provider. So these are some of the things that you have to think about before going into doing um, the analysis. So <clears throat> now let's um, talk about the first phase um, of doing the analysis. The first phase is called the build cost estimation. Um, the build cost estimation phase, this is the first phase where you first prioritize all the features so that you are able to identify the most important ones you need. Um, this list is going to help you in assessing uh, the vendor, uh, vendor products as well down the line. Um, the important features, as we call them as priority zero features, are going to be what defines your minimum viable product. Make sure that you work with engineering in this space. Identify what takes um, you know, engineering to deliver uh, these, uh, these features in the shortest uh, time frame. Essentially, you look at how many people can work in this product in parallel. Um, and um, you know, also look at look at um, you know, and this 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 is going to be your internal time to value yeah, the time to value uh, if you were to kind of build uh, this product internally. Uh, this factor is something that you'd use to be able to assess your vendors as well because the vendors may not have all the features that you ask for. So you have to look at you know. What is the meaningful time frame by when you get these minimum uh, capabilities that you're looking for uh, from the vendors as well when you make this assessment? In addition to this, um, this factor, the time to value, you also have to assess the engineering manments to build these capabilities out. Uh, the engineering manments um, will give you a rough estimation of uh, the cost uh, of building the product, uh, taking you know the average. Uh, cost of engineering in your company, um, and um, and also where you desire to build this product, um, you can actually determine what's the average cost per engineer to be able to determine the overall cost to be being able to build a minimum viable product. Um, add to this the infrastructure cost, the integration cost, the cost to be able to maintain this product. So this is going to give you like um like an estimate of what the build cost estimation is going to look like. <clears throat> now, let's look at the next uh, phase of the evaluation, which is the vendor evaluation phase. In this phase, you will identify the vendors who solve this problem uh, with products, right? Uh, one way to look at this is you can go through the, uh, you know, the magic quadrant from Gartner, identify the leaders in this space. Evaluate these vendors for financial stability. Um, whether they fit the product, um, whether the you know they they consider the product to be uh, a key part of their overall strategy, and uh, and if the product is clearly in alignment with um, the vision and the mission that they they state, uh, also evaluate if they are a strategic vendor to your organization. Uh, this helps you in ensuring that you have leverage with the vendor. Also assess how responsive the vendor is. Um, you know, during the entire process uh, of engagement with the vendor, uh, you know, make notes of how responsive uh, the vendor is so that um, down the line, if you were to go with this vendor, you want to make sure that, um, you know, the vendor is, you know, able to cater to your needs, address issues on a timely manner, um, and, um, and as a result, you'd see better, better success with, uh, if you were to go with this vendor, uh, if you deploy uh, this particular product in your organization. Uh, look for vendor reference feedback. Um, ask the vendor to share references. This is, sorry, this is going to be crucial for you uh, so that you know that you are not an outlier, especially when it comes to scale, when it comes to certain use cases. Uh, you have other customers who are using the product. Um, similarly, as a result, uh, you'll have better success in getting the vendor to prioritize and address some of the missing adjacent capabilities uh, in the product down the line. Um, so these are some of the things you consider as part of your vendor evaluation process.
Now let's look at the product evaluation phase. Uh, once you have identified the vendors and their products have been shortlisted, um, you can use the following factors to determine which of these products best suit your needs. At this phase, you get to evaluate these products through vendor demos, maybe testing the product out using test accounts. Um, and um, once you do that preliminary evaluation, um, you know you should be in a position to be able to at least identify two or three products uh, that address this particular problem area. Obviously, you first start with you know in terms of the factors, you first start with looking into the features and capabilities um, that the products support making sure that these products offer the, the minimum viable features that you are looking for, at least to begin with. Um, check for scale, check for availability and throughput requirements, ensure that those requirements have been met, uh, you know, uh, and, um, and also as you go through the, um, the POC phase, we'll talk about some of the other things that you could do to be able to validate the product in terms of scale, availability and throughput. Um, the licensing model is going to be a key aspect to look for. A good licensing model helps you in being able to predict the licensing cost based on your current and future projected growth. Right? The licensing model also needs to be modular so that you can pay for what you use from the product. And, uh, and down the line, we will also talk about the options and you may decide to just use part of the product, not the whole. And as a result, the licensing model should ensure that you're only paying for what you're going to use. Um, use the licensing model to be able to estimate the licensing cost based on your current scale as well as future. Um, also assess the product for, you know, whether there's an open source availability, um, because it, do it does help you in de-risking the product, um, you know, implementation. Like, for example, down the line, for some reason, the vendor decides to not support the product product anymore, you have the option and the viability to kind of go in and uh, and start bringing back the open source product and contributing to it and enriching the product. The other is, um, you know, having an open source model uh, helps the vendor accelerate uh, the features and capabilities because now you have the community also contributing into the open source product. Um, also, your engineering team uh, can also contribute uh, to certain key um, features that are very important to your organization. And as a result, the vendor can also accelerate that by pulling in that open source version into the commercial version. And as a result, you get to make benefit uh, from these features showing up much, much sooner in your environment. Look into also the feasibility to integrate into your current ecosystem. And this is going to be really important because, you know, how does this product integrate into your uh, user identity management, how does this product integrate into a monitoring subsystem, logging subsystem, these are all going to be very important to be able to manage the product and you don't end up with having, again, like a sprawl of other um, products that you have to bring in just to integrate this product with. <clears throat> so now let's talk about one of the most important phases, which is the POC phase, uh, which is also one of the most lengthiest phases, I would say. Um, you know, once you have shortlisted the products, uh, preference, as I mentioned, is to have at least two to three different products um, that you have shortlisted. Um, you, you start using these products in your environment. Um, you might have to deploy these products if these are only available on-prem or if these are SaaS-based. Essentially, you have to integrate them into your current ecosystem so that you are able to test and validate your specific use cases um, you know, using your test data, you know, with these products. Um, you validate these products also for user experience, integrations, scale, performance, by sampling real data, right? Identify the internal customers within your organization who can partner with you, uh, with your engineering team, and help uh, try using the product and give you feedback. G grade the product based on, you know, the experience from these users. Um, and as I mentioned, this is going to be one of the most lengthiest phases, uh, phases in the build versus buy analysis. Um, so you have to think about using checkpoints so that you're able to report the results to the leadership. Also, you are able to also at any given point in time, you know, call off the POC for a given product simply because 
let's say does not meet one of the critical uh, use cases that you need to support. Um, also, you're able to also share um, the results um, you know, throughout during these checkpoints with the vendor. So the vendors are also able to resolve issues that you might encounter um, and not uh, just do it towards the end. So now, you know, by, by this stage, um, we have pretty much completed uh, the assessment. Um, you know, we have probably framed, framed an opinion. Um, you know, we've collected a lot of feedback, a lot of data. Um, now you can use all the data, distill it, and then probably frame it into something like a simple matrix. Like, and I put a matrix here. Clearly, this is not like, you know, something that you have to stick to, but I just put something here to be able to help you in saying like, you know, these are some of the factors you have to consider. And, um, you know, you take all the data and then uh, put it together uh, to be able to make a recommendation and use this matrix to communicate to the leadership and, um, and make the recommendation to the leadership, uh, such as, you know, on a scale of one to five, uh, what do you think about the vendors that you've evaluated, um, you know, the products that you've evaluated, what do you think the time to value is going to be, especially when you build the product? And maybe what is the time to value from vendor one, two, and three for being able to get some of the missing uh, critical features that you need? Um, you know, what is the licensing cost? You can use the net present value to be able to uh, estimate the licensing costs for each of the vendors for the current day. And also do the same thing for, um, you know, the build cost. Um, the infra infra cost, the, the cost of being able to run the software on-prem or in your cloud environment, if you were to kind of build and manage this uh, product, um, even if you were to go with, um, you know, the products um, that are vendor-based, you might have to probably install some components maybe in your local environment. And that is something that you have to account for as part of your infrastructure cost as well. The maintenance cost, the availability, SLA, integration costs, these are some of the key attributes uh, that you evaluate uh, the products and uh, your internal build product for as well. And come back with you know, a recommendation and um, you can use something like this to be able to uh, have uh, a discussion with your leadership with your recommendation. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we, um, you know, let's say we 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 have made uh, a recommendation. Now, <clears throat> um, you have to remember that the entire analysis um, doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, a binary decision, right? I mean, you have all this data and you have, um, you know, a recommendation to make. It doesn't necessarily have to be a build or a buy. Um, it could be many other possible um, options. One is you may decide based on your analysis that you probably are better off uh, partnering with uh, an open source uh, product that's out there, or you might want to kind of initiate an open source product uh, project uh, to be able to build uh, these capabilities out. Um, maybe it's because you realize that um, there doesn't seem to be, you know, uh, a viable option out there. And um, the internal build uh, from scratch uh, may be too time consuming or getting talent is going to be an issue. You may also notice that uh, this is a widely accepted problem in the industry and there's no strong vendor in the market. So you may decide to hence partner with the open source community so that you're able to get the mind share and you're able to accelerate and get uh, the capabilities out. The other is, um, you know, you may decide to actually use only a subset of features from a product that you think is the best fit. And you might decide to, um, you know, build the remaining features out um, internally simply because it could be that, um, you know, trying to build um, these features is probably, you know, far more easier and probably, you know, it's um, it's also probably going to be too expensive for you to license um, the entire product uh, because maybe there are scale issues uh, for the remaining areas that uh, you might have to end up paying a huge licensing cost, right? So these are some of the things that you have to think about um, as options um, based on the data that you have collected and doesn't necessarily have to be a build versus buy. 
Um, there are also other interesting options, as I think I mentioned in the early part of the presentation. Um, you could go back and explore, uh, you know, one of the vendors who's small enough uh, to do a talent acquisition. And as a result, you're able to build and own this internally. Uh, typically, this is a case where you're trying to solve a problem which is mission critical. You want to differentiate yourselves from the competition as quickly as possible. And the problem can be addressed um, by you know, identifying maybe a vendor is small enough and acquiring the vendor so that one, you're able to kind of uh, leapfrog because you've got some of these capabilities that have been already built, and then you can extend on top of it. And as a result, you might reduce the time to value but at the same time get uh, some critical functionality in uh, that is going to help your organization differentiate. There's definitely going to be a cost to it when you think about acquiring vendors, uh, especially for talent. Uh, you, you do pay uh, a potentially high price uh, for acquiring a vendor, but uh, maybe the cost is well worth it. And that's something that uh, you have to explore as part of your analysis as a product manager. So now uh, we've pretty much come to like the end of this webinar. So let me recap uh, what we discussed so far. One, the build versus buy is a decision-making framework. It helps organizations to best determine how, how best to use their engineering resources. You know, if do they want to actually dedicate their internal talent, engineering resources uh, to solve this given problem, or should they actually buy a product? Uh, it includes various phases, and some need strong engineering partnership, but as we discussed, uh, the out outcome or the recommendations uh, that you can make don't have to be necessarily binary. And by the way, communicating this early that these are all possible options will also help you in getting the support and the buy-in from engineering as well, because they don't see it to be just a buy versus build, but there are many possibilities. Also, the open source option is going to be pretty attractive for internal engineering team. Uh, so the outcome uh, will vary, as I mentioned. It, it varies, uh, in fact, for the same business problem, if you give it to two different organizations, it will vary based on their internal uh, culture, their bias towards build versus buy. Uh, it also varies based on you know, uh, the maturity of the company, where they are within the growth cycle, and, um, uh, and could also vary based on the problem that you're trying to uh, address, right? Um, so there, you know, there are factors, main factors to, to be considered as part of your analysis. Uh, one is the time to value. Uh, you know, what is the time it takes for you as an organization to build these capabilities internally, um, and then also look at it in terms of, you know, um, other aspects such as the operational cost, the infrastructure cost, uh, the maintenance cost, in addition to the licensing cost and the cost to be able to build a solution. Um, one other factor to consider as you go through this whole process is uh, to look at um, how confident are you uh, that the organization can build, build this capability out. Um, so that is something you have to also look at or how confident are you that you can actually hire um, you know, engineering talent to be able to build this capability out. And that's another aspect to look at as well. So, so I want to end this webinar with a nice quote that I had read on Medium. Uh, you know, it's like the build versus buy discussion is a sign of a healthy organization. Um, it really indicates that the people are thinking about the best way to be able to advance uh, their business, right? So you, because you're taking all these factors into consideration and before you kind of dive in to be able to just go solve the problem, um, you're you know, considering various factors and deciding what is best uh, for your organization. Um, the, that, that is something that is important. Essentially, you're looking at the opportunity cost here uh, for your engineering team whether they should be actually solving this particular problem or you're probably better off buying a product and integrating that into your environment. So um, that concludes uh, this webinar. Um, and uh, thank you all for 
um, for joining and uh, listening. And uh, I'll be on uh, a live chat on the 18th of April um, at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, please bring in your questions uh, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Uh, and I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be um, uh, seeing you all there, uh, you know, during the live chat session. Uh, thank you for attending this web webinar again. Uh, hope this has been useful to you. Thanks.